I've always sort of enjoyed putting things together. I'm not sure really how to explain that, but I think it started with me when I was very young. You know, building the the Barbie house or the doll house. I you know, I could do that for hours. And I'm not sure if it was something as simple as that, but you know, I also like to to paint uh and to sketch and you know, with a broken ankle, there wasn't a lot that I could do. So I started pursuing that. And then I was doing research on interior design. I thought, oh, this is something that I would be interested in. Hello, and welcome to Start Talking, an art gallery of Windsor podcast, where we talk about everything and anything arts related in the Windsor Essex community. I'm Michaela, and I'm the Digital Initiatives Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Windsor. And hi, I'm Abby Lee, and I am the Audience Engagement Coordinator, uh, also at the Art Gallery of Windsor. We're here with our special guest today, Trisha King, who is an interior designer and also teaches at St. Clair College in the Interior Design Department. So Trisha, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a, a little brief rundown on you. I'm a graduate of the interior design program at St. Clair College. I have been working in the hospitality industry, specializing in luxury hotels for about 15 years. And I worked at a firm in Michigan uh, up until about two years ago. I left my job and started a specification business. I've also been teaching part-time at St. Clair College since 2009. And I am now the uh, interior design program coordinator as well. So I continue to teach, coordinate, and uh, run a business. That is amazing and a very, very full plate, but like all very exciting things. So it sounds like quite well balanced, although I'm sure it's it's quite busy at times too. <laughs> it's busy, but you know, I'm I'm so lucky. You know, I'm just, I'm so lucky to have had the opportunities that I've had. I feel like I have sort of the the best of both worlds. I get to share what I love to do with the students and I get to work for myself individually with the business. So I think that both things put together give me good perspective as to what's going on in the industry and make me a a well-rounded designer of course yeah that's that's like really terrific to hear and i'm curious as well because again like i feel like folks in the art industry generally wear many hats and sometimes it can be hard to figure out okay where do i want to focus because i have so many different interests so i'm wondering like with you when did you realize that you wanted to first do interior design and how did you kind of go step by step to finding that passion and starting your career in it? Well, I'll tell you, I didn't plan it. I really didn't plan it. Out of high school, I went into uh, business uh, at the University of Windsor. And after two years, it just really it wasn't for me. And I needed a change. And I really, I wanted to travel, to be honest. So I moved out west. And I lived out there for about seven years and worked in the hospitality industry, uh, mostly waitressing did a lot of traveling, but then I had an accident. I, uh, I broke my ankle and I couldn't waitress anymore. So I started thinking about the things that I wanted to do. And, you know, I've always sort of enjoyed putting things together. I'm not sure really how to explain that, but I think it started with me when I was very young, you know, building the, the Barbie house or the doll house. I, you know, I could do that for hours and I'm not sure if it was something as simple as that, but, you know, I also like to, to paint uh, and to sketch and, you know, with a broken ankle, there wasn't a lot that I could do. So I started pursuing that and then I was doing research on interior design. I thought, oh, this is something that I would be interested in. And that involved going back to school and I'm from Windsor. My family was here and I thought this would be a really good place to start over. I have a good foundation and a lot of support, but you know, I was 29. So this didn't come to me until a lot later. And I applied in the program at St. Clair um, because I heard it was a great program and it certainly was. And I got in. So I did the program for three years and then went on to complete a Bachelor of Interior Architecture over at Lawrence Tech University in the States. And then part of that program was to do um, an internship. So you had to do 100 150 working hours. I ended up finding an internship at a hospitality design firm in Birmingham. Uh, Very small. There were like six employees. 
And I, I loved it. It felt very natural to me. We had a great group of people. I had a fantastic boss. And upon uh, graduation from LTU, she hired me. The rest is history. But I always knew that I wanted to teach as well. I really believe in the school. I believed in the program. I had great faculty and I knew it was something that I wanted to do. My dad taught there and loved his job, you know, for 30 years. So I would occasionally teach a course part-time at St. Clair along the way. Um, this is the most I've ever taught because I left the firm two years ago, but I've always kind of enjoyed having the balance of doing both. So I guess my answer, my long-winded answer to your question is that it's, it was a long process. You know, it wasn't something that I planned. I think it was just this happened and then that happened. And, you know, it just sort of evolved as I was going. That's a really cool story. And I'm sure it's going to be inspiring to many people who are kind of experiencing that same sort of thing where they, they don't figure out exactly what it is that they're going to end up doing right out of college or, or even right out of high school. And they come to realize what they're truly good at and what they really want later on. Can you give some advice potentially? I know everyone's situation is a little bit different and not necessarily that everyone's going to go into interior design per se, but could you give a little bit of advice for people who are going into sort of a, an artistic career path like that, maybe a little bit later on than uh, society would tell them they should be doing that? Yeah, <laughs> uh, sure. Well, I would say you have to try. You have to try. You have to have the willingness to give it a shot. When I started at St. Clair, like I said, I was 29. And I remember sitting in the classroom, a drafting class, actually, and thinking, you know, what am I doing here? I don't know how to read a scale. And I always tell this to the students, like, if you think you don't know anything, believe me, I knew a lot less than you did feet to inches, like calculations. I mean, I've been so far removed from that for so long. But having a good attitude and a willingness to learn and a willingness to try goes a really long way. You know, there are things that you can teach. You can teach skills, but you can't teach drive and perseverance and a good attitude. So I would say put your hand up. Put your hand up and, and give it a shot. The worst thing that can happen is that you decide, okay, maybe I, I'm going to do something else. No one's ever going to fault you for, for trying. So try, persevere, and work hard. Michaela and I are both like, that's such great advice, and <laughs> jumping in at the same moment. So Michaela, I'll pass it over to you. I was just going to say, yeah, exactly what Abby Lee said. It's great advice, and it's brave, right? That's, that's a brave yeah. path to follow. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you. And I think that's so important for people to know, especially because I think sometimes kind of what you were getting at earlier, Trisha, with the fact that you kind of went into this field maybe a bit later than others would go into the field that they're currently working in and that that's completely okay. But I think sometimes people don't feel like it's okay and they feel like, oh, if I'm not at this point in my life when I'm at this particular age, then I'm not doing it right. But everyone's path is so different. So I think that's really amazing that you kept pushing for it and you just kind of knew instinctively, yeah, I, I think I think this is what I'm interested in and I'm going to follow that. Like that, as Michaela said, it takes a, a great deal of of bravery and of listening to your instincts, which is not always the easiest thing to do. <laughs> it's so worthwhile. Like I said, I, I consider myself very, very lucky, but none of it was easy. And I really didn't have a plan. It's a long journey. You know, I feel like now I'm finally, I, I'm really, really happy with where I am now, but it's taken me like 16 years to get there. I mean, it, it's amazing. I've had a great career, really great. Very fortunate. That's a terrific journey. So I'm curious because you're speaking to the journey again being more of a unique one, which I think is fantastic. Like everyone needs to hear about unique journeys to be able to follow their own. Along that path, when, for instance, I'm thinking of maybe when you're, you know, 29 and you're speaking to like your family or friends, like, I want to follow this, this path that I haven't sort of ventured into before. Yeah. Did you have a lot of support in that? Was there any like resistance? Was it more like self-resistance on going on to this path that is unknown? Or was it all like pretty supportive for you when it came to no, you know, I would, telling my, people? My, my family and my friends were, were very supportive. 
interior design has really evolved through the years and with HDTV and everything now, you know, it gets a lot of attention, but at that time it didn't. So I think my parents were concerned and I was concerned too, you know, am I going to get a job in this? At the end, I've changed my entire life to do this. I was older, so I was living on my own. I was paying rent. I was working. And there was anxiety, I guess, as to you know what would happen at the end. But I really think that if you want a job, you, you will find one. It might not be exactly what you want to do right away. You might have to diversify a little. But every job that you get creates a new experience for you. You make contacts. So you never know what that one job that you weren't so excited about is going to do for you. When I started, when I was working at the firm in the States, I wrote specifications for other people for three years. You know, and I thought, oh, there's no future for me here. I'm never going to get to do any design work. But now I, I do that for a living. So it's funny how things kind of come full circle. Had I not had all that experience, I never would be able to be doing what I'm doing right now. But did I know that at the time? No, but you know, I had a good attitude about it. And you never know what you're going to learn or who you're going to learn something from. So I think you just have to take every experience that you get, even though it might not be exactly what you want at the time and embrace that. That's super valid because a lot of people don't realize, like they want the payoff right away, right? They've, they've right. graduated, like I can do this now, but you need to climb the rungs of it first. Absolutely. You know, it's it, there's no way I could be doing the business side without the 16 years of experience that I've had. It's just, it wouldn't happen. Like I said, it's a journey and it takes a long time to get there. Same thing with the coordinator position. You know, I wouldn't have just walked into that. It took me since 2009 to feel confident that I have the experience that, you know, I can do a good job with this. You know, and I, I try and tell that to the students, you know, you only need one job. <laughs> you don't need 100 jobs. You need one job. Internships are really good jobs. I know they don't pay a lot. And you're working for other people, which I know is not the dream come true. But there's so much value in that. And if you're open to it, you, you can learn a lot from anything. Absolutely. The, the hard work, that's all part of building the confidence, which is mm -hmm. then in turn what, you know, like you're able to back up that confidence because of that experience right. that you have and because you know that you've put in the work to get there. And actually, speaking of putting in the work to get there, can you tell us a bit about, you're, you're self-employed now, correct? In addition to working for St. Clair? I am. I am, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about that specific journey and what it took to make that happen? Again, I wasn't planning it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, really, if you make good connections with people, and this is really, I mean, I think, I think it's important in everything, but especially in project work, if you make good connections and you're helpful on a project, people might not necessarily remember you, but if you aren't helpful and you are not nice to people, they will remember you, but in a bad way. And I think I had learned how to sort of navigate the minefield sometimes and, and make good connections. So. What happened was we, we was a sister office, so we had an office in Chicago, and there was an office office in Michigan. And uh, my boss in Michigan got sick, and she was pretty much ready to retire as it was. So I thought, oh great, you know, what am I going to do now? I, I was teaching part time, still at St. Clair. You know, it wasn't really on my radar to start a business myself I was very happy you know just teaching part-time at the college and and then um I was contacted by someone that I worked on a project with like five years before that I think I met for like 10 minutes and I had no idea that they would even remember me and they said we'd like someone to write specifications for this hotel but our firm is in Miami can you do this and I thought you know, how am I going to do that? I can't be fly. I don't have a work visa. I can't be flying back and forth. So I did some research and I was able, I am able to write the specifications. I write them from my dining room table. I send them off to Miami. All of the drawings come from Argentina. But again, I think that 
if I had let all the logistics of that get in the way and not tried, like not looked at so many different avenues as to how I could make this work, this never would have happened. I think it took about 30 to 40 emails back and forth before we finally figured out, okay, this is, we can actually do this. So it was a bit to get there, but uh, it's been, it's been great. I've been doing it for about, yeah, two years now. I've worked on two large projects with them. I'm hoping to you know, reach out to some other businesses. Now is obviously not the greatest time with COVID, <laughs> uh, but I still am going to do that. It's been great. I really again I just I feel so very fortunate to have that opportunity it, it just sort of it, it did have just sort of happen and it didn't just sort of happen I'm not sure if that makes any sense but I think if like I said you make good connections with people and you're you're helpful that will get recognized yeah I think you touched on something so accurate there like the arts community is not big mm-hmm. and so if you know since word of mouth is so powerful people will remember you exactly like you said whether you've been having a really good reputation and you Mm. add a lot to a project or if you know you're never showing up or you're like always cranky that's that's something that's probably going to be remembered even more than the (laughs) the former (laughs) being like helpful and it's very clear I mean you speak of how how lucky you've been and how grateful you are like I think all of that that gratitude that you're speaking of people remember that and obviously that gratitude makes you feel good but it also extends to others and it's passed on in, in the best sort of way. I'd also like to touch on, I know you're just speaking of um, kind of working remotely with this group in Miami, um, which is which is terrific. I mean, especially in this time, Michaela and I were both working remotely. It was like the vast majority of people who are working remotely that can are. So I'm curious in terms of how this remote working landscape with COVID, has that really changed your work? Has it made you kind of have to be even more creative than you already are? Or have things kind of gone along similarly to how they were before everything changed with COVID? I think from the business side, because I was working at home before remotely, not too much of that has changed. Aside from the fact that I have two little children and I'm used to them being at school, they haven't been for chunks of time. So that is challenging for sure. Certainly not just for me, I think for all parents who are working at home. So that's, that is a challenge. The teaching, definitely the larger challenge there um, because we're used to being face to face in the classroom. And, you know, with design and architecture, so much of it is hands-on. It's my communication with you in the classroom, my body language, everything. That is certainly more challenging online. But again, the ability to like to put your hand up and a willingness to try and learn goes a long way. So I think at St. Clair, we're definitely embracing this challenge. You know, we have courses and programs, and we're really trying to find unique ways to engage the student. And then, like I said, it's just, it can be done. It's just a matter of diversifying the way that you did things before. I think the career and everything, same thing with COVID. I mean, when you look at businesses, restaurants that never dreamed of doing the amount of takeout order and the curbside, I mean, they've really stepped up to the plate and people have really come up with some unique ideas to, to survive, right? So again, I think it's, it's about you know, embracing the challenge. Definitely. And we have a changing landscape in in more ways than one. Like even if COVID didn't happen, the world is just so rapidly changing and people's right. concerns are changing. And um, mm-hmm. there's there's a lot going on. So actually in terms of that, and we've, we've been asking um, every interviewee this question, something that's, that's worth considering with any career path that anyone might choose. Is there any specific or are there any specific ethical concerns to your practice in in general like in the field of interior design or in yours specifically or in in what ways is your practice being progressive and making the world a better place well i think the use of environmentally friendly products now is the lead certification everyone is is striving towards that for a number of years it was about using cheaper materials and things that weren't lasting um, Um, But there's been a real shift 
to getting back to, you know, using natural materials, environmentally responsible designs, LEED certification. It's just the way of the future. So, you know, we really do have to embrace that. Ethics, I think that will that will always be an issue. And I really think that depends on the designer or the architect individually. We know what the right thing to do is. We know what the right things to do are. And whether those are chosen or not, I think that largely depends on the individual. But I can tell you what I have seen in the past is that those that choose that that quick route, you know, that quick, easy, copy something, copy someone else's work, take the credit when when it's not yours. Those people just don't last in the business very long. It, again, there's a reputation that follows that and follows those decisions. You know, it's just your repre- reputation is really everything in, in this business. So, you know, those are not the right <laughs> choices to make and talk about that with the students often sometimes hard to do to know what the right choice is but it's there the right decision is always there and it's yours to make that's a great answer i know initially like when michaela and i were talking about potential questions to ask and and different things like that i never really considered for myself anyway ethics outside of the realm of research and like more you know scientific ethics that sort of thing but you got some really really interesting answers and and very similar some of them uh the answers especially in terms of environmental sustainability it's so exciting that that's like one of the first things that's that comes to mind now in terms of ethics and and considerations for best practice it's really heartening to see especially i know sometimes and when it comes to environmentalism there's a lot of negative news out there so it's great to hear of folks who are really looking to enhance the environment and just kind of put a more positive spin on it yes i i'm i'm going on i will digress now um, but it's it's just nice to hear that that positive news especially with everything going on in our current landscape so thank you so much for sharing that with us um so i'm curious too i guess kind of pivoting a little bit from the previous question. I, again, I feel like I'm learning so much about design just speaking to you now. So I'm wondering, would you describe yourself as having a particular style when it comes to design? And like, has that changed at all since you started? I think so. I think it takes experience working on different types of projects. I think to kind of develop your own, a little bit of your own style, it, it's such a unique balance because you know, you're hired by clients to do what they think they want you to do. A lot of times they don't really know what it is, you know, that they're looking for. They they think they do, but that's why we're there, right, is to, you know, guide and educate clients and to put sort of your own style on a project. But yeah, I would say that I tend to gravitate towards, you know, natural materials, natural stone, natural wood, um, environmentally friendly products, because I think they're like not only a a good choice, I think they're a conscious choice. You know, they're going to last. As an example, if you do, you know, a kitchen renovation and you use all bright colors, well, are you going to like that two weeks from now? Like, sure, it's trendy, but you have to think about like the longevity um, of everything too. So I would say that my style is sort of more, um, more classical, perhaps more architectural, not, not ornate and really decorative just because I feel like it's just a better choice to use those types of materials again, um, that are going to last. Like you can always change out a throw pillow, right. Or, you know, a blanket, it's a lot harder to change out a, a big sofa, right. And it's more expensive. So I think there are a lot of good reasons behind using natural, um, and I would say mostly neutral palettes. That makes a lot of sense to, to me personally. I prefer kind of more, I guess, muted tones myself because, yeah, I agree about the longevity. And there's something personally that I find more calming about them mm-hmm. and less garish or jarring. I can appreciate mm-hmm. like the cuteness of a room that's that's all bright in color. But would I want to live there? Would I, would I, would I want to spend a lot of time there? Right. right. I mean, and that's that's something to think about, too. Like there's so much it goes into every decision, you know, the location, where is this? Is this a vacation home? You know, if you're on vacation, do you want your vacation home to to look like your house? 
Maybe you do. Maybe you want it to be totally different. Maybe you want it to be reflective of the beach. So there are so many different decisions, I guess, that go into coming up with the the overall concept. But yeah, I would say my style is definitely more neutral based, environmentally conscious. And I, I do tend to gravitate towards natural materials. That's good. That's good. To, that's that's reassuring to hear. Like anytime there's one per even just one person, you know, considering sustainability in their practice, that's that's mm-hmm. really good to hear. And and speaking of your style and your practice, do you have like a favorite place that you've designed? Jeez, it's so hard. I, I've been so lucky. Like I said, I've worked on so many different projects and a lot of it is is the people that I got to work with. The projects were, were truly all very great. You know, they were mostly luxury hotels and beautiful spots around the world. There was nothing to complain about there. But when I think back, it was really the people, like the groups of people and the other consultants that I I got to work with that, you know, some were, were more fun and enjoyable than others. We did the uh, Four Seasons in Orlando on the Disney grounds. And again, design is not individual. Even with the spec writing, you know, I'm still collaborating with the designer and then the architect and the drawings that are coming from Argentina. I'm still working with other consultants and groups of people. And so while I sit here alone and do the work, I'm still always collaborating, which I really like. But, you know, I would say maybe the Four Seasons in Orlando because our entire office worked on that project for five years every day. It's something that I'm especially proud of for us as a group. You know, there was nothing individual about that. There was no way uh, one person could have done it by themselves. So I think it was the collaboration between us and all the other consultants. And everyone was so dedicated and helpful. And it was just, I get chills. Like When it's like that, it's just such a great process. You know, when you get a group of people that are just so, so into it. I don't, I don't think there's, there's anything better than that. So I guess if I had to pick one project, it would be that one based on the people that uh, I got to work with. Yeah, we're so lucky in the arts. There's so many collaborative opportunities. I think especially now working remotely, we're so lucky right. to have that because it does make it feel, at least for me, um, less like you're working on something in isolation and more that you, yeah, you might be by yourself, but there's a lot of other kind of pals working alongside you in their own separate spaces. So it does feel like more of a community that way. So that's, but wow, getting to work on the four seasons, like my goodness, that is definitely a stellar project. (laughs) It was a very good experience, a very, very good experience. And um, I did get to bring my family there because we could never afford to stay there normally. (laughs) Uh, We did get a few free nights there. So that was really nice to at the end of all of this, because, you know, it's, it's, it was a lot of hard work. There were a lot of late nights and my family made a, a large sacrifice, you know, for me to do that. My husband was home with, you know, two little babies a lot by himself. For me to be able to bring them there and show them that and they got to experience it, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of meaning in that for me. That's really cool. Yeah, I think those projects that you have a special tie to your, to your heartstrings with become mm-hmm automatically more meaningful, more easy to favor. And just as a a follow-up to that question too, are there any sort of like dream projects that you have in mind for the future or dream spaces that you would like to work on? Dream spaces? Oh, there's so many. I'd like to do a spa. I've never, other people in the office, the office in Michigan got to work on a spa and I never did. I think I would really, really enjoy that. Mostly what I, I've done, you know, bars, restaurants, um, public space and guest rooms, but I've never done such a unique environment like that. I think it would be really interesting. And again, I think you could really incorporate so many beautiful natural materials. I think that would be sort of a, you know, a dream come true. <laughs> One of these days, hopefully. Yes. Well, once things have calmed down with COVID, if you ever design a spa, let us know. We will be there. Yeah. We'll be enjoying it. <laughs> like, I will. I will. I will. I will. It sounds like it would even just be something relaxing just to work on, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's such a different, like every part of interior design is so different. And the information that you 
need and that you learn on every project is so unique. You know, if you work on a bar, you learn about food service equipment and the size of the dishwasher and how big the bar needs to be and how tall. And you really sort of become an expert on each individual area because there's so much information that you need aside from doing the design work, you know, to put all this together. So a spa, I mean, just the information that you would need, I think would be a great learning experience. For sure. That's, that's really cool that you get to take a, like a little tidbit of every setting you work in with you afterwards. The learning is, is unbelievable. I mean, sometimes it's, it's often very quick, but again, and I just, I can't say this enough. If you have a good attitude and you work well with the other consultants, my experience is that they're going to help you. That's terrific. I mean, it seems like it would be so exciting at getting to learn so much about all of these different spaces yeah. and yeah, like continue to take that with you into the next project and the next, like you're just adding more and more tools to your toolbox really. So, well, I hope you get the chance to work on that spa. I just want to thank you for taking the time to meet with me. This was so enjoyable and I love educating people about interior design and uh, what we do. And hopefully this inspires uh, young people to think about the profession or the profession of going into the arts. We hope I so, hope so too. too. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you so nice Thank speaking with you as well. So enjoyable to converse with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Thank you so much for listening to Start Talking. We hope that you keep talking about all of the things that we've spoken about today and all of the art in our local Windsor Essex community, even long after our podcast episode is over. If you're interested in finding out more about the Art Gallery of Windsor, you can find us on our website at www.agw.ca or you can follow us on social media at AGW401. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe and be well.